You ready? Okay. Hi, right, we're live streaming. So everything you're gossiping about is being broadcast. Um, so number one, Henry Hope next week. Um, I, I think everyone knows that now. Same, same time, same place. Um, and number two, I'm going to introduce our reader. My, in, my carefully crafted introduction was locked inside my office by, by these two. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my um, so I kind of reconstructed it. It's not as good. So it's a first draft now. Um, I, all right. Our guest tonight is Miriam Gerba, who is the author of four books. Um, the newest is Creep, uh, a book of essays. Um, that, um, well, I'll say more about them in a minute. A book of essays, Lean, um, a memoir, which is kind of what attracted me, what, what connected me to Miriam as a writer first. Um, and it, it's kind of my undergrad's favorite book. Uh, and for, I think, three, two or three reasons, but um, one of them is definitely a kind of edgy, dark comedy. Um, especially an edgy dark comedy around topics that do not lend themselves very easily to the comedic. Um, and also a kind of provocation, right? A, del a deliberate provocation of the reader. Um, and it, you know, it was very nice to see my undergrads kind of you know, go with it. Um, there's also painting their portraits in winter. Um, and a collection of short stories in Dahlia Season, a collection of short stories in a novella. The, um, uh, Miriam has the, has the honor or the dishonor of being one of the writers whose work has been, so does Brian actually, um, two people in this room, whose work has been sampled um, for chat GPT for the kind of new, um, which, which is a whole issue, right? Um, the, what you will hear tonight, I will be at the very least what I would call a braided narrative, one that uses the personal and the historical, plus a third thing, which is harder to pin down. Um, and I would say that's a kind, it's a kind of, it's not exactly the comedic which runs through, right, but there's a kind of what I'll call a trickster logic. Um, and that trickster logic work goes kind of from puns to dazzling, but always economical metaphors, um, all the way up to a kind of incantatory or spell-based grammar. Um, all of Miriam's subject matter touches on or focuses directly on topics that we would consider within the realm of social justice. Um, Miriam is an abolitionist. Um, I would say all the work focuses on what I would call necropolitics, right? A, a system that, a, a, an organized system that channels bodies not to organize them, but to kill them, right? And it's a kind of structure of, of who gets killed. And the BIPOC people fall perhaps first within the lens, but particularly women and then particularly girls. So there's a very uh, kind of, there's a lot of space held for, for the girl, right? For the, for the not yet adult woman, um, including herself. So that's my, that's my, that's my um, outline for an introduction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome, Miriam. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit from Creep. I'm going to read from the essay titled Kukui. And to give uh, a little bit of context, uh, Kukui is an essay that opens in my classroom. I was a high school teacher for over 10 years. I worked in Long Beach. And um, this essay introduces the reader to several sort of archetypal villains. Um, 
And uh, one, of, one of the villains who will appear later on in the essay is um, a figure who I've written about before. So he's a figure who I wrote about in Mean, uh, a man named Tommy Jesse Martinez. And he's somebody who sexually assaulted me when I was uh, 19 years old. Um, and so he appears and reappears in, in Creep as well, and he appears and reappears in this essay. However, he is preceded by several other creeps. So um, I'll go ahead and dive into Kukui, and um, there are several breaks. I'm not sure how far I'll get, so if I do come across a break, I'll just go ahead like and announce it, because um, that way we'll understand that there's, there's an intentional silence. Um, let's get started. Kukui. I used to introduce a certain civics lesson with a mugshot. The last time I taught the class, I projected this sad photo onto a screen mounted at the front of my classroom. A tired Mexican, his upper lip lightly shadowed, gazed upon us. Leaving my podium, I approached the screen, pointing at the mugshot with my yardstick. Check it out, I said. This picture was taken by Phoenix police in 1963. You can see the guy's booking number on the sign he's holding up. We're gonna talk to our neighbors for a moment about who we think this man is. And we've got a little while to discuss the following questions. Why was this mugshot taken? What did this guy do to become famous? A football player growled, give us a clue, Gerbil. <laughs> okay, I bet you already know this guy's name. There's a speech named after him that I bet a lot of you have memorized. My high schoolers, especially those who looked like the tired Mexican, took their instructions seriously. I roamed, listening to them improvise his identity, history, and significance. Shy boys huddled discussing the possibility that the guy in the mugshot had immigration-related problems. A few steps away, girls vigorously argued. One faction believed that the tired Mexican was caught driving without car insurance. Another faction believed that he'd hit an old lady with his car. Turning to a girl with braids, a girl with braces said, I think he got busted stealing food to feed his family. Oh, said the girl with braids, that's so sweet. I vote for stealing food. <laughs> Once five minutes had passed, I announced, we have some time to talk to the whole class now. Anyone who wants to can share who they think this man is, why he's famous, and why the cops took his picture. Since it wasn't every day that a Mexican appeared in our curriculum, the kids were itching to connect with the man in the mugshot. One boy shouted, that's my Uncle Edgar. Another yelled, no way, it's my cousin Hector. Other students compared the mugshot to friends and classmates, pointing out similarities between eyes, noses, lips, hair, and ears. A boy named Freddie blurted, that nerd was late returning books to the library. Everyone laughed. How come you think that, I asked. Because that fool looks like Kevin Ortega. I tried not to laugh. The mugshot did resemble Kevin Ortega, a nerd I'd be teaching next period. <laughs> <laughs> he did look like him. <laughs> <laughs> Once every kid who wanted to speak had gotten their turn, I said, all of your theories were interesting to hear. Now I'll tell you who this guy is and what he got accused of. This guy's name is Ernesto Miranda. He didn't get in trouble for jaywalking or stealing milk or running people over with his car or for keeping his library books too long. In 1963, Ernesto Miranda was charged with kidnapping and rape. Kids gasped. That guy? Rape? Yup. But he looks normal. I said I agree. Perfectly normal. So normal, in fact, that he looks like many people we know. Everyone was sitting up straight. You guys want to hear the story of what happened to him? Yes. Okay. It's March 1963. The setting is Phoenix, Arizona. 
Think cacti, lizards, sand, tumbleweed, an unforgiving sun. Have any of us been to Arizona? A girl waved and shouted, Yuma, I've been to Yuma. I said, excellent. That's near where Cesar Chavez died. So anyway, detectives knock at the front door of the home of Ernesto Miranda, a dock worker who loads fruits and vegetables by night. Holding their baby, Ernesto's common law wife, Twyla, answers and, wait, what, screamed a girl? This motherfucker has a child and a wife? I thought you said he was a rapist. I said that he was charged with rape. And why wouldn't a rapist have a wife? In a tone suggesting that he was stating the obvious, a short boy answered, Miss Gerba, if a guy has a wife, he shouldn't have to rape nobody. <laughs> and that's a quote. <laughs> <laughs> I took a deep breath, pointed to the mugshot, and said, this is what a rapist can look like. They're normal, everyday people. And we probably had moments in our lives when we have associated with rapists and didn't know it. You know, no one walks around saying, nice to meet you. I'm a rapist. Want to hang out? A rape has nothing to do with a husband or anyone else not getting enough sex. Do you hear me? Instead, rape has to do with geography, with putting a victim in her place and making her stay there. Got it? Most of the girls in class nodded. Returning to our story, I told everyone that detectives took Ernesto to a police station where he was handed a numbered placard and ordered to stand in a lineup with three other men. A two-way mirror reflected their unsmiling faces. On its other side stood a nervous 18-year-old girl. She'd reported to police that during her walk home from work, a Mexican man wearing glasses and a white t-shirt had kidnapped her. After tying her up, he drove her to the desert and did her dirty. Only one man in the lineup, Ernesto, wore glasses and a white t-shirt. Still, the girl was not sure that he was her attacker. Cops marched Ernesto to an interrogation room. They sat him down and they lied to him, telling him that he was in big trouble. Several women had positively identified him as their attacker. A detective handed Ernesto a copy of the standard statement form. Ernesto scrawled his name on it. In the spaces provided, is the door opening by itself? <laughs> I think it would be fitting. <laughs> okay. A detective handed Ernesto a copy of a standard statement form. Ernesto scrawled his name on it. In the spaces provided for age and education level, he wrote 23 and 8th grade. He filled the rest of the page with a plain yet anatomically graphic confession that ended with him driving his victim home. His last words to her were, pray for me. Girls gasped. The nerve, one shouted back, or one shouted, I know I shouted back. The confession led to Ernesto's conviction and a judge sentencing him to 20 to 30 years on each count. Ernesto's lawyers appealed his case and Miranda versus Arizona was eventually argued before the Supreme Court. The question before the justices was this, can the confession of somebody like Ernesto, a modestly educated poor person who doesn't know that they're entitled to have a lawyer help them with the police, be admitted into evidence? The Supreme Court's answer to this question was no. Ernesto had been coerced, cheated out of specific protection. Had he known about the Fifth Amendment, the law that gives us the freedom to keep our mouths shut, when cops try to make us say what they want to hear, Ernesto might have kept the knowledge of his dirty deeds to himself. Had someone told Ernesto about the Sixth Amendment, the law that's supposed to guarantee us access to an attorney, he might have gotten decent representation, a lawyer who could have advised him to save his confession for church. The lunch bell was set to ring in a few minutes. I scooped a small stack of papers off the table and walked from group to group distributing them. I said, next time we meet, I'll finish telling you the story of Ernesto Miranda. And I'm passing out the little speech I was telling you about. It's called the Miranda Warning. Like I said, you probably have it memorized. If you don't, practice it. Read it to the mirror. Read it to your dog. Read it to your mom. Mirandize your grandma if you have to. 
I'm going to ask someone to recite the Miranda warning next class. That'll be your quiz. I can recite it right now, Freddie yelled. <laughs> he made a fist and thumped his chest. The bell rang. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Freddie. Maybe next time. <laughs> Most kids scooped up their backpacks, purses, or bags and shuffled out of the room. A few stayed. Two Mexican girls sat in the corner by the thermostat, eating sandwiches and mumbling, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you do, can, anything you say, can and will be used against you in a court of law. Two other Mexican kids, Paul and Daniela, sat at the table by the radiator. A plastic bag filled with baby carrots rested between them. They took turns fishing nubs out and dunking them into a small plastic container of ranch dressing. Watching them was making me hungry. Can I have a carrot? I asked Daniela. Did you forget your lunch again, Miss Gerba? Maybe. She laughed and said, I like this class. Paul said, so do I. What do you like about it? I asked. Paul said, I don't know, it's chill. Daniela said, I like learning about crime. <laughs> the only other class where we learn about crime is forensic science. What do you do in forensic science? Beaming the way sports fans do when asked about their favorite team, Daniela answered, oh my God, we had a unit on serial killers. It was so fun. We got to pick our favorite and do a presentation on him. My favorites are Jeffrey Dahmer and Richard Ramirez. <laughs> like this is all real. Like this is literally <laughs> happening in my classroom. This is not fiction. Okay. <laughs> hey, I like Richard Ramirez too, said Paul. <laughs> Daniela asked, who's your favorite serial killer, Miss Gerba? <laughs> my mouth went dry. My palms began to sweat. I sat on my hands. In a small voice, I answered, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? Why not? Rather than explain that I had my own Richard Ramirez, I said, I just don't. Daniela shrugged and ate another carrot. Break. The thing I never wanted to be was a teacher. What boring lives those people led. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Most of their friends were teachers. At the dinner table, we never heard any good gossip, only <laughs> teacher talk. I wanted to be something fun, an archeologist, a painter, an architect. If I couldn't make any of those happen, I'd settle for being tall. <laughs> I practiced being an archeologist whenever I could. Summer vacation allowed me to dig full time. I'd hop on my bike and sail down sidewalks, ready to break my father's rule. My brother, my sister, and I weren't allowed to leave our neighborhood alone, but I left all the time. I opened my mouth, tasted the country air, and pedaled toward what hadn't been a river in years. I intended to sift through the trash scattered along its thirsty bed. A rusty spade rattled in my bike basket. I found the tool in an empty lot and considered it a good omen. I was meant to excavate, to inspect ruins, to court decay. Perched on shale, alligator lizards napped in the August sun. Tumbleweeds tangled in barbed wire fencing shivered as pickup trucks roared past. I huffed and puffed. Sweat matted my tomboy sideburns, a bead of it sliding down my golden neck. I breathed through my mouth. Someone had run over a skunk. Its bisected remains oozed on the warm asphalt. Before the freeway came into view, the liquor store appeared. My feet pulled back on my pedals. I hopped off my bike and cautiously walked it into the parking lot. I circled the store, looking for signs of him. They say he hitchhikes, I thought. And evil has to eat and drink, too. He could be in there, buying Twinkies. I didn't know his name yet. None of us did. We'd glimpsed a rough police sketch of him. San Francisco's first female mayor, Diane Feinstein, had flashed it at us on TV. 
During a late summer news conference, she had announced somewhere in the Bay Area, someone is renting a room, an apartment, or a home to this vicious serial killer. I'm hoping that people will look at this composite drawing. After looking at the composite drawing, anxious Mexicans made jokes. Too many of us knew someone, an uncle, a brother, a cousin, or a friend, who resembled the police drawing of the Night Stalker. That's what the tabloids had dubbed him. He had terrorized Southern California for weeks, invading homes, torturing victims, and murdering them. Now he was doing the same up north. We lived along the Central Coast, near the 101 freeway, a road the Night Stalker might have used to get to San Francisco. Our town, Santa Maria, was a convenient place for travelers to get out of their cars, stretch their legs, and refuel with a snack. The Night Stalker drawing looks like a watercolor by Picasso, Dad had said during dinner. <laughs> Which one, I asked? El loco. After shoveling everything on my plate into my mouth, I sprang out of my seat and sprinted to the bookshop holding our encyclopedia set. Grabbing the P volume, I flipped to Picasso. No locos, only Guernica. I completed my inspection of the liquor store parking lot and decided that the coast was clear. The only other people in the lot were a trucker eating a hot dog and a woman sobbing into the wheel of her pinto. The night stalker was still on the loose, but he hadn't made a pit stop here. I hopped back on my bike and sailed north, toward the county line, toward the riverbed. Break. The night stalker had struck in a scattershot pattern. Rosemead, Monterey Park, Whittier, Monterey Park, Monrovia, Burbank, Arcadia, Sierra Madre, Monterey Park, Glendale, Sun Valley, Northridge. After exhausting the Southland, he had turned his attentions north. Once he murdered in Lake Merced, taking the life of Peter Pan, a 66-year-old accountant, that was his real name, he killed somebody named Peter Pan. It seemed that all of California belonged to him. Like the night, he could materialize anywhere. Homeowners installed window security bars. Handymen crouched, boarding up cat and doggy doors. Mexican grandmothers snuck into the bedrooms of grandchildren who worshipped Ozzy Osbourne and sprinkled holy water in the four corners. At swap meets, kids were told that if they strayed from their mother's sight, they'd get smacked with a shoe. Calloused hands locked deadbolts, and we prayed that if you know who wandered onto our street, he'd scurry past our mailbox and oil-stained driveway. If the night stalker had to take lives, I hoped he'd pay a visit to my enemies. I was old enough to have a few. I was eight. <laughs> Some Mexicans murmured that the night stalker and El Fukui, a boogeyman who kidnaps and dines on naughty children, were one and the same. Because Mexicans compulsively assign nicknames, many of our families have the Fukui. Mine does. Ours is a huero to be avoided. To call someone a kukui is a public service, a warning. A kukui is a person who should, under no circumstances, babysit. Some theorize that the legend of El Kukui was spawned by an Iberian superstition, El Coco. Duermete niña, goes the monster's macabre lullaby. Duermete ya, que viene El Coco y te llevará. Duermete niña, duermete ya, que viene el coco y te comerá. In 1799, the Spanish painter Francisco Goya self-published Los Caprichos, an album featuring impressions of 80 etchings and aquatins. Goya's 43rd Capricho, que viene el coco, depicts the backside of a shrouded figure approaching a bed. A seated woman stares at his face, transfixed as she clutches a frightened girl. Beside her huddles another scared child. The sheet draping Goya's coco hints that he might not be supernatural. The artist's caprichos were, after all, satire. Maybe El Coco is mommy's special friend in disguise, the one who comes to keep her company at night when daddy is away. 
If the children can be convinced that a boogeyman roams their house at night, they'll be less tempted to spy. Our parents used neither el coco nor el cucuy to prevent my brother, sister, and me from wandering at night. They relied on a soggy murderer, La Llorona. There are countless versions of her legend, but one ingredient always stays the same. Water. The story has to have water. One retelling of it goes like this. In a Mexican village, a married man takes a smitten girl as his lover. He enjoys getting her pregnant and leaves her with a big litter of kids that she has a difficult time feeding. Every time the husband comes to see her, he promises to leave his wife, swearing that soon they'll be a proper family. Years pass. Her beauty withers. So does her faith. She accepts that her man is someone else's. He'll never leave his old, balding wife. She's an amazing cook. With nothing left to do but make the unfaithful husband pay, the Sancha walks her bastards to the river and feeds them to it, holding them down until the bubbles stop. She lets out an ungodly moan and wades into the freshwater grave joining her bobbing children. In death, the Sancha grows a conscience that dooms her sobbing ghost to slog through mud. She wanders riverbanks, looking for children, short or tall, plump or scrawny, freckled or buck-toothed, any child will satisfy her. She wants to be a mother again, wants to press kids close to her bony breast, sniff their fontanelles, cover them with fleshless kisses. At this moment, along a deserted riverbank, she's weeping and begging, where are my children? Where are my children? Have you seen my children? When dad recited this tale at bedtime, he imitated La Llorona's screeching groans, and he sounded like Liberace. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and stop reading there. Um, yeah. Ramirez appears a few places, right, and you've used him elsewhere in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and the the role that he plays is um, it's a complicated role right? yeah. because he's he is he's irredeemably evil. Yeah. Right. You can't can't. There's no salvation. But he is also a, a Latinx man, mm -hmm. right, and. It, it fuels into a whole like machinery right, mm -hmm. of, of racism. Absolutely. Um, and I'm wondering that there are other figures like that too, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what is it like? Why has he remained so central as like a reference point for you? I think that he remains so central for me because he was uh, a childhood monster. Like I grew up in the '80s in California and lived, you know, in between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And uh, and we lived in fear of Ramirez slithering through the window. Like it was just, it was, it was part of of the culture to to have this paranoia that this this man who was who was spoken of more. Uh, as a creature, right, than he yeah. was as a human, like that, that, that this that this actual kukui come to life was lurking through California. And so I think that he he influenced sort of my horror imaginary. He, he left an imprint on it. For those who don't know, um, his trial was televised and um, he had carved a pentagram into his hand and he would often flash it at the news. And I just remember being like a little girl sitting at the table doing my math homework 
as Richard Ramirez is flashing the engine from, <laughs> from the TV, that leaves a mark on you. <laughs> and so, and so he, of course, he's going to emerge in, in, in a work like Creed. And um, and I had mentioned earlier Tommy Jesse Martinez, the man who sexually assaulted me when I was 19. Um, he was I. Uh, uh, Sentenced to 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 die. He was he was sentenced to death here in California. He had a sentence commuted, and when he was uh, living on death row, he he lived adjacent to Richard Ramirez. So I do have this one degree of really macabre separation from Ramirez. So that's another one of the reasons why he's he's this touchstone for me. Uh huh. How do you like, especially with these kind of personal experiences? How do you make sense of your students' fascination with serial killers? Mm -hmm. Um, so that fascination is something that I'm fascinated by. Um, and at the time, it wasn't so much that I was trying to make sense of it as it was that I was just trying to survive. <laughs> the um. The, the, the sort of fetishization that they were so eagerly expressing. And what I was most struck by wasn't their fascination. What I was more struck by was the pedagogy <laughs> being employed by their teacher. That their teacher was, um, was putting on a pedestal these people who you've just described as irredeemable and who are real. Right? My grandmother is buried next to two of the Night Stalker's victims. These are real people. And for example, Ramirez, he committed his crimes in California, and yet here we are to Southern California High School, where Ramirez is being treated almost as if he was a celebrity. And so it's not so much the kids who I fault, it's the teacher. I remember being so bothered, and every time I see him on campus after that, I was like, I'm gonna go that way because I see this guy come this way. So yeah, it was, it's it's really the adults. And my next book is I, hopefully will be an exploration of that question: what prompts this fascination with true crime in the United States, um, and why is it that its primary consumers tend to be women? So that's hopefully gonna be my next my next book. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'm curious. There are so many creeps in the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to write it out. Uh, and I, I'm curious if there was any like method to like who you chose to write about, and then like the connections, because like each chapter is not just about like one person. There's like these you know webs of connection to to other people, whether it's in your family or like historical or cultural or or whatever. Um, so yeah, how did you kind of make the choices that you made around that and and for those connections, one that ones that you had to like kind of do research on or like seek out, or did they kind of come just sort of naturally? Yeah, so the I knew that there was one creep in particular who I was gonna be writing about, and that is I uh, my my former abuser. I was I was I was trapped in in uh, a situation where I experienced IPV, intimate partner violence, for three years. So I knew I was going to write about that particular perpetrator, and um, I determined that I was going to be putting that essay last. And so um, before we reach him, we're introduced to all sorts of other creeps. And I selected those figures because I'm trying to assemble a genealogy of sorts. Mm -hmm. So it's a genealogy of influences. Um, and, and I, I do like to emphasize that we don't get to pick our influences. They choose us because they creep into our lives, right? And so, um, and so I create both this um, genealogy that invokes family, but then I also create this literary genealogy that I try to situate myself within. And so I have these um, figures who I have been referring to as literary creeps. And so the, the easiest example to sort of uh, reference is, is Didion. So I, have a, so I have an essay on Didion where I, in a sense, do give her her flowers because she was um, an incredible influence on my writing. At the same time, uh, her, her writing is incredibly problematic, especially as racial grammar. And so I approach her as a creep figure. Um, 
And, and, and for me, creep is sort of like this bucket uh, into which we can place certain kinds of figures. And it's a gender neutral bucket. <laughs> so there are, um, there are various like feminine creeps moving through the book. And, and you'll find them um, uh, uh, writing novels and educating children. <laughs> William Burroughs is another one. William Burroughs, yeah, I think he's he's one of the very first the very violent creeps he's mentioned. Yeah. Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, um, because the two books that we read for Matthias is not for more nonfiction, um, but I know you've written fiction with class. Is that something you plan to return to? And would you still try to utilize a lot of the same themes that are in your nonfiction? Yeah, I um I am eager to to return to fiction, and I have started dabbling in it. Um, I've I've been you know on a nonfiction kick for a really long time, and it's been easier for me to publish nonfiction. Um. But uh, a couple of months ago, I did have a piece of fiction run in LA Times Image Magazine. It was uh, a short story about a witch who is shopping for some magical supplies in a strip mall <laughs> in, <laughs> in downtown LA. <laughs> um, and I, I actually want to take that and explain it. I think it opens. It opens in a smoke shop. She's. She. I think she's buying a lighter. Um. But yeah. I. I. I have. I'm. Um, I have that. That story and several others that I would like to um, fit together into a short story collection that is going to be linked by um, a few motifs. All of the stories will have uh, Latina characters, and every story will somehow involve marijuana. <laughs> so, and I've been, we could say I've been researching for this collection all my life. <laughs> 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 so, uh, as far as your method goes, in terms of that, do you feel like you can swing back and forth between projects, or is it kind of like once you start on your nonfiction, like, this is my next project, and you have to stay on that track until you're done? I feel like I can move back and forth, especially with short stories, because they're so self-contained. You don't need the sort of um, sprawl, and like, like, like you don't need the same sort of um, creative space to have that sort of um, uh, sprawling project unfurl. So I feel like I, I can move with ease between nonfiction uh, and short stories, but I have not like tackled long fiction in the form of a novel yet. I mean, I'd like to, but I don't know that I have the wherewithal for a novel, so. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, sorry, I was just really interested in um, your telling of La Llorona, because I hadn't really heard that version before. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you had like a different impression of La Llorona as an adult as you did when you were a child, because it sounded like your rendition was basically La Llorona was a child who got groomed by an older man who had a wife yeah. and then just impregnated her a bunch of times and then left her with nothing. Yes. Uh, so I was just kind of curious, like, do you have the same impression of La Llorona when you're younger or is it different or, you know, pick them or first trader? Or yeah, like no, this is, a, I love this question. Um, so, yes, I absolutely have a different relationship to that folktale as an adult person than I did during childhood. But during childhood, instead of being frightened by these sorts of stories, I loved hearing macabre Mexican folk tales when I was a kid. I was like, give me more, give me more. And like, I was see, your, your kind of true crime. Yeah, as a child, yeah. So like, so I would like pump adults for these stories. I'd be like, so, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I like, wanted them. And they would excite me. You know what I mean? They would excite me. They wouldn't necessarily scare me. Or if they did scare me, it would be a kind of delicious fear where I was like, is it real or isn't it real? And if it is real, can I invite her? You know what I mean? Like, because she's a ghost. And so it's not like the fucking front door is going to keep her out. And so, exactly. And there's a river down the street. And so, like, so, like, it's fine. 
Exactly. And so I would so I would be like, okay, so if I leave my feet dangling off the edge of the bed, is La Llorona gonna come tip? You know what I mean? That was sort of the kind of mentality that I had about her. And I didn't really, as a kid, think very critically about the gender politics of the story. And as an adult, they're horrifying, right? They're absolutely horrifying. And I heard multiple versions as a kid. And so that's one of the many versions that I heard as a kid that it was this uh, that it was that it was a jilted or a thwarted lover's revenge, right? Um, the other story, the other version that I heard as a kid was very different. It was this that um, La Llorona is an indigenous woman, and she knows that colonizers are coming. And rather than have colonizers harm her family, she executes them. So that's the other version that I grew up with as well. And so um, the and these were bedtime stories for us, <laughs> which is a part of the puzzle. <laughs> like it's wild, you know. Um, but yeah, as an adult, uh, it's it's such a misogynist. It's such a misogynist story. It's just got such such on. Um, such a macho bent to it, um, and 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 now as an adult, when I hear that story, I think of these sort of true crime headlines involving um, women who perpetrate infanticide, and and it's so common that women who do engage in that are experiencing postpartum psychosis and are not getting appropriate medical treatment, and. And they're demonized for it, which is disgusting. And the United States is one of the um, the progressive nations or quote unquote developed nations that most harshly punishes women who who engage in, in infanticide rather than, than than providing medical treatment. So yeah, it's 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 a grotesquely misogynistic story. <laughs> I do remember though when I was so when I was living in Long Beach. I was staying with this friend who was a total stoner. And then there were these other stoners that lived adjacent to the LA River. And they would get stoned in their basement and then hide from La Llorona. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> more comments? Yes. Um, you talk about how you don't get to choose your influences and sort of creep into your life. Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned earlier um, in our in our classroom discussion that, with, particularly with me, you felt like you were writing against a lot of narratives and trying to bring humor into a place where. Humor is not often found, so I'm curious in hearing if you if you have any like humorous inspirations that you feel mm. kind of helped you with that, or if you really felt like you were writing against the grain and you were like, no one is doing this, so I have to do it. No, there were absolutely inspirations that I had, and those inspirations um, are stand-up comics. Mm -hmm. So. So that kind of humor, so the kind of humor that I engage with on the page is the kind of humor that people are much more comfortable coming from a stand-up comic, but not coming from a literary memoirist, you know? And so um, and so I uh, I was like consuming like a lot of stand-up when I wrote mean and and that influenced mean a lot. It influenced sort of like the structuring of a lot of the humor because it was very kind of punchline oriented. Um, and as as a kid, I I loved comedians, um, and and I did. There were male comedians who I admired a lot, especially like slapstick comedians. Like um, as a as a as a little girl, I was a huge fan of John Candy. I <laughs> loved John Candy. I could not get enough of that man. And he died in Mexico. He died in the he died in Durango um, while he was filming a uh, western. Uh, he had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, but uh, he 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 was somebody who I, I admired intensely. Another person who I admired a lot when I was a kid was Gilda Radner uh, from Saturday Night Live because she also engaged in like a lot of body humor. 
and um, and it wasn't, and then her femaleness was not the butt of the joke. Like her femaleness was not the punchline. She showed me how to use your body as a tool for comedy. Mm -hmm. And so she was, she's another sort of uh, influential figure. So, so uh, I, I very much admired sort of body comedians <laughs> and body comics when I was a kid, but um, but the sort of the influence of stand up came through my ex spouse. So my my former spouse was an aspiring stand up comic. And so I would often go with um, them to comedy clubs. And comedy clubs are terrible places. <laughs> 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 they are sad, dreary little caves. So, like, I would sit in the corner with my ginger ale praying that somebody would make me laugh because they're just such <laughs> unfunny places. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and and so you know I would watch these assholes on stage and think like God they're just not funny I'm gonna try this and so then I started you know attempting humor on the page and so there was definitely definitely an influence that happened in those clubs. <laughs> Something I have been noticing all day is that when like I feel like I know you well as a writer from having you know taught me twice and read it really carefully, right? The way you do for teaching. Um, and there's so many, there's so much dark comedy there that's impossible to parse. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, and, and that's part of its power, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like I don't know how this line is supposed to fall, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in person, you're much, you're you laugh yourself, right? You you you, you kind of. Did guide us much more than we're guided on the page. Yeah. And I wonder about that contrast of, of that, because there's a withholding on the page yeah. where you're not going to tell us. Well, I think that what is happening on the page, I think that what is happening on the page is that the reader is looking for cues that give permission. Sure. Kind of like when uh, you know the audience of a situational comedy sees the laughter sign. Like <laughs> people are waiting for that on the page, but they're not going to get it. And so there's this discomfort, can I or can't I? Am I sinning if I laugh at the wrong thing? You know, and so it's kind of fun to play with an audience in that way. Um, and then, you know, you can hear me uh, in person. And so, so much of comedy is in the beats and you can hear my beats. And, um, and there was a study done of um, comedic rhythm and it was found that um, comics, when they use comedic rhythms that we've been trained to understand can elicit laughter by saying completely unfunny things because we're like dogs that have been trained to laugh on rhythmic cue. So that's what's happening with us right now. <laughs> I would love to talk all night about <laughs> no, it's really, and, and also comedy on the page versus comedy and performance, yeah. they're, they're utterly different. Yeah. They're, they're, and, then, and then the kind of the genius people who can write comedy to be performed, right? Yeah. Um, I think well, that one of the reasons why comedy tends to be purged from like literary writing is because it has such a short shelf life sure. and people want longevity for their work. And so, yeah, I was I was being interviewed by a reporter a couple of weeks ago, and and she was asking me some challenging questions about the humor in my writing, and I just said to her point blank, I go, humor doesn't age well, and I know that my humor is not going to age well. That's just the nature of humor. And then that headline for the piece became, Miriam Gerba knows her humor won't age well. I mean, they went all the way, right? <laughs> like, they went all the fucking with the distance. <laughs> just like American Park, like planned obsolescence. Exactly. Or exactly. Sell more because it'll break down. <laughs> we, have, we have one, one um, last brilliant stinger of a question to take us up to reception. I have a question. Yes. So I have the most boring question. Uh, try us. Okay. Um, I want like something I meant to ask earlier today. Um, kind of around more, of, you know, the professional sort of beats, I guess, of you know, from writing your first work to critique. Like, mm -hmm. How do it happen? 
How did it all happen? Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> For instance, too, was it, you know, like, phone, as a living thing, um, pursued from school? Were there any, like, grants or fellowships, or were certain support that maybe you reached out to, or, you know, sort of that infrastructural? Sure. Yeah, I'll give, like, a description of the trajectory from the first book to the fourth book. So, the first book was an accident. Um, <laughs> I had written, like, several short stories, and this um, guy who operates a small press in Portland had read some of them. His name's Kevin Sansel. He had Future Tent Press, and he um, had been invited to um, select a manuscript for an imprint that he was doing through Manic Bee Press. So uh, he emailed me and said that he had seen some of my fiction. Did I have a manuscript? So I said yes, and then I wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had about half of it, you know what I mean? I, like, I, I finished it, and then I sent it to him, and he was like, okay, we're doing a book. And I was like, holy shit, because I didn't solicit it. You know what I mean? Like, it just happened. So I was like, whoa, okay. like." Is this how books happen? Like, <laughs> but, you know what I mean? Like it was just very strange. So, so that book happened, and then a couple of years later, I was in San Francisco reading at the public library, and um, the woman who owned Manic D, who had offered the imprint to, to Kevin Samsel, she was in the audience as I was reading um, as part of the series at, at SFPL. And um, she was like, hey, I really liked that thing that you read. Do you have a manuscript? And I was like, yeah.
So, so writing a proposal was really weird because you're basically writing a book about a book. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I wrote a book about my book, and then we took it like to various editors and met with them, and then there was basically like um like an auction, you know, and and Simon and Schuster won. <laughs> so yeah, so it it was really really different like this book was so different like it was just amazing to get like money <laughs> like real like real money you know what i mean not like you know like yeah so it just yeah so this this experience of this book was so fucking different yeah. than than the first three yeah. <laughs> so the moral of the story is always have your shit with you like always have it with you as if it's like your business card you know what i mean like distribute it yeah. also learn how to give good readings what learn how to give good readings oh this is yeah and learn how to learn how to promote your work and per and learn how to perform it because so many writers are their own worst ambassadors like and and if you like it and if and if and if performance doesn't come naturally to you, then you need to practice. You need to practice and you need to hear your work. Like you need to write with your ear, not just your eye. So yeah. It's also like a million modalities of performance. Like mm -hmm. I've heard people be really like like tight, you know. Yeah. And it was still a great performance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many different ways. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs>